Oh oh. Welcome to the lecture on. Well, it's a marvelous night for a moon dance with the stars. Earth moon. It's not really a lecture. It's more like just a few pictures and some talking. Uh, I really am serious about not wasting your time. Change to the mic. Oh, oh, oh! Just a second. <laughs> I'm working on my studio decorum here. I'm really serious about not wasting your time. The first time I recorded it was 15 minutes exactly. YouTube won't take anything over 14.59. The second time, 15.39. The third time I realized I had included things that didn't need to be in there, all about the phases. So I had to take those out the fourth time. I went long again. So here goes the fifth time. What's interesting is the moon is always out. I know that sounds weird to say, but it's always somewhere around the earth. You can see it sometime during the day or the night. We don't think about it. A lot of people think it's out only at night. No, half the time it's out in the day. In fact, right now, this looks to be a sunset picture. The sun obviously is down here somewhere and has just set, and it's lighting the right and the back portion of the moon, what we call the dark side of the moon. Here, in this case, some astronomers are mooning some people. Don't tell your parents I'll get fired for this. Okay, origin of the moon. I don't need to talk to you about that. It's very cool. But when you get to the study sheet, there are two podcasts that are worth listening to. Put your phones in, listen to those. Uh, one of them was recorded recently on a Science Friday here in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, from NPR, interviewing a scientist from ASU. Features of the moon. Take a look at the moon. Crust, mantle, core. You notice something missing? There is no liquid outer core. With that missing, and without a plastic or flowing mantle, the moon doesn't have any tectonic activity. It does have quakes. One, from tidal pull from the Earth, and two, from meteorite impact. But something, is weird, something weird is going on here. Notice the thickness of the crust on this side, the thickness of the crust on this side. What's going on? The Earth's gravity has pulled the more massive core sections toward itself. We have distended the moon's center of gravity toward the Earth, which is kind of weird. That probably happened in the early days of the moon when it was still molten. Now, one of the theories is that the moon was formed by something coming along, let's say a planet named Tethys, and it came along and hit the Earth. It glanced and then went into orbit around the Earth. As it did that, it melted a huge amount of stuff. The melted stuff went into orbit around the Earth and the moon, some of it landing on Earth, some of it landing back on the surface of the moon which is why the interior of the moon may not be like the Earth. The exterior could be simply made of Earth parts that coalesced after this big collision. Let's raise our knowledge a little bit and take a closer look at the moon. You climb up that ladder with me. In the old days, we called the dark areas Maria. If you've ever climbed up on top of a mountain near the ocean, in certain areas the ocean looks dark. So they named these Mare Imbrium, Mare Serentatus, Mare... Mare uh, Tranquilitas, the sea of tranquility, the sea of dreams, the sea of serenity. They're not really seas. You know mare from Italian, mar from Spanish. If you want to say it in Greek, it's thalassa, so that doesn't work. But maria means seas. They are really basalt. These guys are fairly recently, geologically, molten rock, whereas the highlands are much older rock. Down in the maria, there are rills like old lava rivers, uh, remember the chapter on volcanoes where I'm standing on top of a lava tube? Something like that. The highlands are made from breccia, welded together impact type rocks. A crater and rays. I've got to do this really quickly, I get carried away. When I was in the classroom, I'd lay down a piece of plastic, put a bunch of flour on top of the plastic, sprayed the top of the plastic with spray paint, and then I would get a tennis ball and throw it really hard at the flower. And the lighter underneath parts of the flower would be thrown back, just like the meteorite crater in northern Arizona. That's what forms the rays near the craters. Now, what darkens the surface of the moon? Micrometeorite impacts and cosmic radiation will actually darken the surface of the moon over time. You can try this at home. 
uh, probably best to do when your mom's not looking. Just grab a 10 pound bag of flour, dump it on the floor of the kitchen, and then spray paint it dark, and then throw the tennis ball at it. She will really love you. And I did not tell you to do that, so don't do it. Okay, do it outside if you want. But get your parents' permission. What's the surface of the moon like? Well, at least in the Maria, it's very soft material called regolith. We landed in the, and explored in the Maria, not the highlands, because, well, it's kind of hard to land there, at least back when we were doing it. This is what it looks like up close. This is what it looks like up closer. Here's one millimeter. You end up with obsidian. You end up with the glutinates, which are little pieces of things that are glued together. And here's some feldspar. Wait, same thing we have on Earth? Yep, same thing we have on Earth. If you remember, the principal elements that make up Earth's crust, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, and iron, take a look. This is the moon. Oxygen, silicon, aluminum, and iron. The first two are in exactly the same order. However, the moon has a few different materials, a lot lighter materials on the surface. Kind of strange. We could use some of that titanium and magnesium. Now, you would think that every time the moon goes around the Earth, it would block the sun on this side and would go behind our shadow on this side. Mm, it would if we were all like a basketball and a baseball and a ping pong ball on a tabletop, but we're not. The basketball and the baseball are on the tabletop, but the ping pong ball goes way underneath the earth and then rotates back around here and way above the earth. This obviously is out of scale. The moon's orbit is tilted about five degrees to the orbit of the earth-sun plane called the ecliptic. Now the moon's orbit is not a circle. It is what's called an ellipse. If you put a tack in the middle here and tie a string to a pencil and go around, you'll make a circle. But if instead you put two tacks, wrap a string around it, and then put your pin there, you make an ellipse. The further apart you put these things, the more oblong the ellipse becomes. All planets, most satellites, travel in what's called an ellipse. A circle, kind of, with two focuses. Not one center point, but two center points. You can try this at home. It's really kind of fun to do. Um, if this is the Earth and the pen represents the Moon, there is a time when the Moon is near the Earth. When it's near the Earth, typically in October, it is called perigee. When it's furthest from the Earth, it's called apogee. Apogee away, perigee proximate or close. Good to know for a potential quiz question. Take a look. People don't realize this, which I find really tragic. We'll watch TV, we'll watch Dancing with the Stars, but we don't even know what's outside our own windows. During perigee, the moon is about 14% bigger than it is in apogee. It's really kind of cool. Now, if you want to look at the moon, don't go buy an expensive telescope. Grab binoculars if you have some. Go outside and look at the moon, and not when it's full. Get it when it's a gibbous, a quarter, or a crescent moon. That's the best time to look at the moon. Now, eclipses. Any object in space will cast a shadow, two parts of a shadow. Let's say you're in a little UFO-type uh, craft, and you go behind Earth here. When you go into this area, we call it the penumbra, you're going to see part of the sun. When you go through this area, you won't be able to see any of the sun. Let's say you're right back here, you're not going to be able to see the sun. And the same thing happens all the way out here. This is called the umbra, which means extra dark. This is the penumbra, which means kind of dark. The moon has the same thing going on, but its umbra is smaller. The penumbra is bigger. So what's this have to do with anything? Here you go. Sun the Earth, and the Moon. If the Moon, instead of being below the Earth or above the Earth, is actually behind the Earth when it's going around us, it can fall into or go through our umbra and be completely darkened. Now, it doesn't get completely darkened because some of the red light, sorry, some of the light from the Sun gets bent around Earth's atmosphere and continues to fall on the Moon. Which particular color? Well, it's the red. So people in the old days said the Moon was filled with blood. They had to kill a lot of people and throw people off cliffs and stuff like that, apparently. I mean, that's what you do, right? It wasn't. It was just the moon being eclipsed by the Earth. I know this is weird, but if you're on the moon, right now it's a solar eclipse. If you're on Earth, this is a lunar eclipse. And you can still see the moon in a lunar eclipse. What's the other major eclipse? Let's move the moon over to this side and let it block our view of the sun, and that's a solar eclipse. 
Here's a total solar eclipse, a partial solar eclipse, and an annular solar eclipse. Let's talk about these for just a minute. When the moon is close to the Earth, perigee, it can throw its darkest part of the shadow on a little area. Now, if you're in this little area, you're going to see the total eclipse for only a few minutes at most. Why? Well, the Earth is rotating this direction, and the moon is moving at the same time. So this creates a little path of a shadow across the Earth. It's really kind of cool. I had a picture of it, but I lost it. Let's take a look at a partial solar eclipse. Let's say you're up here in Europe, oh, in Spain. During this time, you're not going to see the sun completely blocked out. You're just going to see part of the sun blocked out. This is what you're going to see. Don't ever look at the sun unless you have a super dark welding mask. I think it's a 14 rank or higher, and even then, I don't try it. I use a special telescope or the pinhole thing, never looking at the sun. If the moon is too far away, you don't ever get the umbra falling on the Earth. You just get the pin umbra, and this is what you're going to see. This, by the way, is great for astronomers who want to study the atmosphere of the sun. There we go again with a partial eclipse, a total eclipse, at least for the people out here in little islands in the Atlantic. And here is a chart of when eclipses occur year by year. You'll see this in the second part of the lecture series, so I won't dally here. Tides. The waters of the Earth, if there were no moon and no sun, would just be about the same height all the time. But that's not the way it works. We've got a moon pulling on the waters of the Earth. So let's say we're uh, here, let's say we're in Hawaii. As we rotate underneath the moon, midnight, sunrise, noon, sunset. As we rotate underneath the moon, we're going to go from high tide to low tide to high tide to low tide. The only problem is that during those 24 hours, the moon will have moved a little bit. So it really takes about 24 hours and 50 minutes to go through a high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. But the moon isn't the only thing pulling on the waters of the earth. There's also the sun. It's weird, but the moon has a bigger influence than the sun. The sun's way bigger, but it's also way farther away. So the moon, in this case, is a little bully. Now when the moon and the sun are in line, either in the new moon phase or full moon phase, you get what's called a spring tide, where the high tides are extra high and the low tides are, oops, sorry, the low tides are extra low. I love these when I lived in the South Pacific because I could walk out on the reef, it would be exposed, and I could look at all kinds of critters. However, if you get stuck out there and the tide comes in, you're going to be in trouble. If you're a boater, you love this kind of stuff because you can glide over the reef without injuring your boat at all. Now, a week later after the new moon or a week after the full moon, the moon is pulling one direction, but the sun is pulling another direction. What happens? Well, the moon tries to win this direction, the sun tries to win this direction, and neither one wins. You get a low high tide and a high low tide. These are called neap tides. Take a look. This is a neat tide, and that's what's going on right here. This is a graph of the height of the ocean. Here's the high tide, the low tide, and during the neat tide, the high isn't very high, the low isn't very low. During the spring tides, the high is higher and the low is lower. Back to a neat tide and then extremely high tide. Here we are in Honolulu, Hawaii. You get a really high tide during the new moon and a really high tide during the full moon. During the quarters, you don't get such high tides. And yes, I know I'm rushing, but we have to do that. And that's all, at least for this section. Thanks for listening.